Um, what we need to look at is uh, how our health ministry organizations and networks developed. And the uh, model that probably Diane and I are most familiar with is institutional based, which that in our terms mostly is hospital based. You know, someone at the hospital has taken on the role of coordination of the health uh, ministry programs and that coordinator will provide uh, educational sessions uh, for the health ministers to be involved in and uh, provide that information, much of what Diana has already talked about this morning. Um, this really became very popular in the 1990s as an outreach effort from um, hospitals. I'm also am familiar with one in Cincinnati that basically is based through a long-term care facility of the Episcopalian Church. And they operate their uh, health ministry through the long-term care. But it basically is an outreach effort of that um, institution, organization, with the understanding that, and the hope that they will be able to uh, reach to the underserved and those people that they don't interface with as often as maybe they would like, don't have the resources to do that. So it has been looked at as a safety net for the uninsured, and that continues to be a problem uh, even today after the many years of health ministry and when it began in the, uh, the 70s. Um, so that um, piece of our uh, population, the disenfranchised folks are the ones that really benefit from this program. Um, it's often associated with a contract or what we might call a covenant. And I know that scares people off, but basically all it does is um, it lays out what the hospital or the institution will do and what the church organization will do. And usually that's um, very basic stuff, and it defines, you know, well, the hospital will provide some education, they'll provide some leadership in the program, uh, and a little bit of um, uh, mentoring uh, for the church folks who are hoping to do this. Where in the church, their responsibilities might be that they will, in fact, support uh, this ministry within the congregation, and those church volunteers who will uh, willingly step forward and, and do this programming, uh, either in a, a, as a paid basis or a volunteer basis. So it can be done either way. But the contract is really very simple. It's more or less the who will do what. Um, then the coordinator uh, actually establishes the health ministry. And the way I found uh, this to work best it's just a one-to-one -one approach. And quite honestly, and I'm just going to speak from my experience of doing it in the past, um, I tend to look for a nurse or an individual who has a passion to do something in her church. And then together, <laughs> after we talk it through, um, then we approach the leadership of the church. And uh, for the most part, I will tell you that there's an individual in the church who's passionate to do something. The leaders of the church usually will support that person. If you go to the pastors, you can go to the pastors with an oversight of what health ministry is. But for the most part, it just kind of goes like that. <laughs> um, it, it isn't um, that they don't support it. Um, but they have so many things on their plate, they don't really have the time to be searching for another volunteer out there to implement yet another program. They're still stuck on who's going to do BBS this summer, <laughs> who's going to teach Sunday school this summer because Emma's sick and, you know, got 30 kids in that class and who's going to be there. Um, so they've got lots of other issues that they're dealing with. And often starting a new program isn't something that they're really interested in nor do they understand the idea of health within a church uh, congregational setting. Um, when they think of health, 
we often think really more of a medical model of illness. Well, if you're going to be, if you're a nurse and you're going to work in our church, does that mean that you're going to go home and take care of Aunt Susie who had a stroke last week? Will you be able to help out with that? Or are you going to change dressings on this folk uh, when they need it? Or, you know, just what are you going to do? So sometimes establishing the idea of wellness and wholeness and prevention is a very new message to folks within the church. Um, so that has that bridge has to be passed. So we really are looking more at an overall wellness model. And quite honestly, nurses aren't always familiar with that either. Because where do nurses come? You are nurses, LPNRN. Okay, how many of you are in some form of health ministry from your church? Okay, so we have a mixture here. That's great. That's great. Um, if you are a nurse, or even if you're a hospital employee, we pretty much work in a medical model, a disease model of sick people. And it is busy, and it is packed with things to do. And very often, we don't have time to talk um, about what's going to keep you out of the hospital. <laughs> what's going to keep you from becoming a diabetic so we don't have to take care of you and worry about how you're going to pay for your diabetes medication? What's going to help you uh, actually become motivated to be physically active? We all know we should be. That's what stops chronic disease. That's what's filling our hospitals to overflowing. But nobody's talking about how can we help ourselves be healthy. That, those are the things that health ministry and nurses in churches, whether you call it a parish nurse or a faith community nurse, either one interchangeably, that's the role that we want to look at. And sometimes, you know, if I just get up here and I start talking to you all about being physically active and not drinking sweet drinks anymore and losing 10% of your body weight so you don't become diabetes, you're going to walk out of here and think, woo, I don't want to hear any more of that. <laughs> Where are we going to go eat tonight? Um, but you know what? If you do it through a church ministry where you know folks, where you know the people that sit every Sunday and Wednesday beside in the church pew beside you, that you attended that church for 15 years, you know their kids, what troubles they've been through and what problems this individual's been through. And if we talk to that person at that point, they trust you and you trust them, and we start saying, you know, we really need to do something about our way. We really need to change up these carry-in dinners. They're killing us, aren't they? What's more unhealthy than a church carry-in? They're wonderful. But what's the goal? What's the goal of a church carry-in if you're fixing something? What is it? Fellowship and eat, but don't we love it when every our casserole dish is completely gone? Yes, they love that dish I took in there today. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes our motivation isn't what it needs to be. We need to be thinking of folks in different ways. Okay, the other thing uh, that, and remember today, is, is we're really just touching on some of the high points of health ministry and parish nursing. A faith community nursing program is what? 40-hour program? right around a 40-hour program. And when I took it at Malone College years ago, I took it in three 12-hour days. And I, it was a former surgical nurse, and I thought, my gosh, she's going to get me through this fast. <laughs> and she did. But it's, it's a lot. Of, there's a lot more information. So this is just really some high points. But... Um, and, and I want you to think, you know, outside of our counties and outside of Appalachia, 
But some churches are actually big enough in this country that they can pay for nurses to work in the churches and do this. They can be paid positions. You interview for them and you have a job description and you go to work. And that's what your job is. Um, in our communities, most of our churches are small rural churches. And I'm guessing at maybe 50 people on a Sunday morning. Am I there? Maybe 100 people? Um, so we're not talking about big churches with big incomes at the end of the Sunday when they pass the plate around to do a collection to support nursing. But what we found across the country when we asked people to do this is they will volunteer their time to do it because they're passionate about it. And it's a job that has tons of autonomy and, you know, things that you can't really do in your job at the hospital or your job at the clinic or doctor's office. This is the kind of stuff that you want to do to make it fun, to develop your own programs. So lots of folks will do this um, in a voluntary basis. Then there are congregational models of care where it is created actually within the church. I know the Methodist church has um, an emphasis on health ministry and there are even small mini grants that are available through that denomination. Same with the Presbyterians, I think the same with the Catholic church. So depending on the denomination, there are some incentives and there is some organization towards health ministry. And so if you do belong to any of those denominations, you can always get on the internet and find out what, what is actually available for you. Um, and so, you know, they might have an, uh, a certain uh, protocol for how to develop this within the, the congregation itself. But the role, I feel, is, is more one of ministry and passion. Um, there are many of us who do things, particularly in the church, if we don't really have a strong feeling about it and feel that we can really help people in some capacity. And the role is, is focused on really what the mission of the church would be. Um, you can all, it can also be organized through a community coalition model. If you have a, a group of uh, interested folks within the community who come together and they might want to just um, encourage this, promote it, see that education is brought to the community, so it could also be done in that manner. Um, one example of this, well, might be the, the long-term care that I mentioned earlier, but even area agency on aging, if you're familiar with that, I know they've sometimes been involved in health ministry. But again, um, expanding capacity to care for folks and to uh, demonstrate the value of prevention and wellness um, can come from any of those particular models. Now, the faith uh, community nursing um, is uh, one of health promotion, disease prevention, uh, based on whole care of the person and encompassing seven separate functions, which Diana has, has really talked on those a little bit earlier. Um, but again, uh, it is pretty much about a 40-hour course to really go through all that, to really understand all those roles clearly. But uh, this has been developed by the uh, American Nurses Association, and there are, of course, standards of care. And um, so if we're calling ourselves a faith community nurse, we need to be very familiar with those standards of care and how we're going to implement them in our congregation because they have lots of the same facets uh, that we're used to in professional nursing. Uh, in health ministry, um, well, we'll go, I'll come back to that. Uh, these are the functions in terms of educator, personal health counselor. How many of you are actually serving as a wellness coach or health counselor? Um, we've got several of you serving in, in that role now. 
Okay. Um, a coordinator of volunteers. You can't do very much on your own. Again, as Diana talked, we have to be able to delegate. We have to find some, you have to find the doers in the church, you know, who, who knows how to set up the tables when you need them. Who's going to carry in some food for you when you might need it at a special event? Um, who's the organizer? Who can do the mailing? Who can do phone calls to get folks there? So you need lots of doers working with you in that congregation on a committee, your little health committee, that expands your capacity of what you can actually accomplish there. Um, you might also, uh, the referral agent part is so important. Um, you really need to know your community and when you come up with a problem identified by your congregational members, you are invaluable to them if you can tell them, you know, they provide this free service at this health clinic, just 10 minutes from where you live. You can get that accomplished. You can get immunizations for your children at low cost right here. You don't have to get a doctor's appointment and, and pay that fee to get that accomplished. You can ask for transportation here or here, but you need to know that community and have all this resources quickly available that you can help folks in terms of troubleshooting these types of problems. Um, lots of folks are very comfortable doing support groups or you might have somebody in your church itself. We've had several churches in Portsmouth who have come together with support groups. Um, many years ago, um, we had a, a Methodist church who had a young man who was diagnosed with Tourette's. And oh, everybody in the congregation was just so compassionate, concerned about this family and how they were going to deal with that. And they called me and they said, you know, we really want to start a support group. And I said, yeah, that's, that's really kind of an unusual thing, you know, Tourette's. I don't, I don't know if there are folks out there that are interested or not. And they put a little thing in the paper, they were, they were not to be daunted. I mean, they were going to go for it anyway. So they put this little ad in the paper, and they got 30 people to come to that support group. I mean, they don't last a long time. Most people come for information and know, you know, who else they can call if they need to. But they actually had a small support group for people that were suffering from Tourette's. I thought that was very interesting. Um, we have another Methodist church who, and I, I think you still have it at Cornerstone, a support group for bipolar. Yeah. Is that, that has faded away. Okay. But you're doing another thing now, um, recovery. It's for Celebrate Recovery, Celebrate recovery which is a uh, program for folks who have had problems with um, alcohol and drug addiction. It's a 12-step program for anybody who has a hurt habit or hang -up. Did you hear that? 12-step program for anybody with hurt, habit, or hang up. Or hang I like that. I think I could fit in that. Okay, but you know, you just have to have the desire to do it. You have to see the need and take some action, and people can come together and can heal each other. You know, what, what is it better than to say, Sally, I understand what your family's gone through. My family's been through it. You know, or this is what we can do together. You call me anytime you need me. But these kind of connections can really um, uh, be motivating for people in the congregation to be able to step forward and do this. Um, we also want to, you know, it's not like just a typical social agency out there. We want to integrate our faith beliefs within the services that were provided. And that's what's so wonderful about health ministry or faith community nursing is if I'm Catholic, my Catholic beliefs, you're going to see it on any of the information that we might want to pass out or when we talk to you. We're, we're talking the same language. We believe the same way. So it's you have very full freedom to do that in this program. You have a lot of autonomy in this. 
uh, and also being a health advocate for folks. Lots of times we need, we have elderly folks who maybe need some testing for dementia wherever we need to know how to get that accomplished or we might need to talk to them uh, personally about you know some health issues that they have going on. Uh, but those are the, the roles that the uh, faith community nurse can actually accomplish. Okay, the uh, lay health minister, uh, you know, these are the, the, the role of the lay health minister. Basically, you don't want to work outside of what you're licensed or prepared to do what you're comfortable to do. A lay health minister role, though, is close, but that person is working within the scope of what a lay individual would actually do. Visitation is so important.